Morning. 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 Uh, so this is what happens to you when you miss home group for a week. <laughs> <laughs> you get uh, elected. I promised myself not to talk about the rugby this morning. So I don't, I don't want to do that, but uh, I'd like to talk instead um, about the cricket. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's not, not fair. Before I get thrown out, this morning's talk is part of the wider series that we've been looking at on the mission of God. And last week, John looked at how Jesus came as a man. This week, we're going to look at, at how Jesus came as a servant. We're going to consider three different aspects of Jesus' servanthood. Firstly, we're going to look at the idea of Jesus as the servant king. And we're going to see the examples of leadership that we can draw upon today in our own lives and within the church. Secondly, Jesus was often referred to as the suffering servant. We're going to look here at what the story of the washing of the feet reveals to us about the nature of his sacrifice for us. And lastly, we're going to examine the cross, and we're going to consider Jesus' ultimate act of service for us, and we'll explore how this great act of love is the resource that we need to help develop our own servant hearts. Now, there's a common thread behind these three aspects of servanthood, which is that the characteristics that Jesus portrays in each case are not only the complete opposite to what was expected of him, but also the complete opposite to what the secular world still values today. And I'd like to just try and underpin that message with one simple image. And if we could possibly have that up on screen, please. Great, thank you. And for the benefit of anyone who might be listening on uh, podcast or MP3, hi, Mum, we're looking here at at an image of two crosses. Uh, One's inverted... Uh, 180 degrees from the other, and it's really just a simple sort of visual metaphor to say that God's coming kingdom is completely upside down from our current worldly kingdom. And without wanting to say too much more about that, I'd just like to leave the image on screen as a reference. Uh, And as we look at these three areas of Jesus' servanthood, I'd like us just to consider, you know, how radically different Jesus' approach and character is from our own worldly values. And if I completely lose my train of thought at any point, you can play spot the famous London landmark on the, uh, on the left-hand side. So the first aspect of servanthood we're going to look at is leadership. And we're going to go back to the passage that we read in Isaiah. We're told in the book of Acts that when the Ethiopian eunuch meets Philip and attempts to understand this passage in Isaiah, he's confused by the identity of the slaughtered lamb. And this, this isn't really surprising because at that time Jews were divided in their thinking of, of what the slaughtered lamb actually stood for. Some believed that Isaiah was referring to the nation of Israel. Uh, others believed that he was talking just about himself. And others still believed that he was talking about the coming Messiah. Philip, however, was, was in no doubt that the passage pointed to Jesus. And before the story of the Ethiopian, in the book of Acts, he's already referred four times to Jesus as the servant of God, and that's picking up on the wider language and context of Isaiah's prophecy. Well, it's easy in hindsight to see where the Jews would have had difficulty accepting this. And of course, they still do today, and that's largely because of their expectations of what the coming king was going to be like. You see, the Jews expected an all-powerful, conquering king. They expected someone of worldly power. And of course, we know retrospectively that Jesus came in great power and with great authority, but he didn't come in worldly terms. He wasn't the majestic leader and the athletic warrior that was going to crush oppressing nations and deliver the Jews to victory and ultimately to God. Now, remember it was the Jews themselves who, against God's will, elected their own great king. Up until around 900 BC, the Jews were governed primarily by judges, and Samuel was the last of these judges, and he was repeatedly harassed by the Jewish elders um, because they wanted him to create a successor for himself who was a great king. And this is what God says to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8. He says, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. 
For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And he goes on to say, However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. Now, Samuel then goes on to deliver to the Jews a litany of abuses that the future king would commit. And as we know, the Jewish elders ignore his warning, and eventually they appoint Saul as the first king of the Jews. So this Jewish concept of a king at the time was largely based on worldly behavior and values. A powerful, rich warrior king, and then Jesus came as a servant, born into a poor family, working hard as a poor man, socializing with the lowest in society, touching lepers, feeding the starving. We're told he came on a borrowed donkey. His last meal was in a borrowed room. Even his tomb apparently was borrowed. He gave up everything of worldly value and was the complete reversal of what they expected as a great leader. He never led by force, and his followers always acted in free will with their own personalities given freedom of self-expression. He served his followers, he healed them, he fed them, he listened to them, he prayed for them, he loved them. Essentially, what Jesus characterizes relative to the rulers of the day was upside-down leadership. Leadership as a servant to those he was serving. And this, this concept of leadership, I think, is still completely radical today. We only need to look at the, all the regimes of dictatorship in our history, and in particular think of the tragedy that's happening at the minute in Libya and Bahrain. And we can see that to a greater or lesser extent, all our worldly models of leadership simply don't work on one level or another. And we have to hold our hands up here, I think, as, as part of the church and say that the organized church uh, has also through history had its fair share of leadership problems. But I think we can be really encouraged um, by what's happening here at St. Stephen's. There are a number of different ministry and leadership areas. Uh, we have worship leaders, we have children's leaders, we have care leaders, which we heard about this morning, and there are various other leadership roles. And the hallmark of all of these areas of church life is that they are led by people who are serving, always of their own free will and often in their own time. And I think in, in this respect, the serving church is a very powerful testament to the God who comes as a servant. And at its best, it strives to reflect Jesus' model of servant leadership. In some churches in China, they actually welcome believers by saying, Jesus now has a new pair of eyes to see with, new ears to listen with, new hands to help with, and a new heart to love others with. So what can we do as servants to help the church? Or another way of putting it, what can we do as leaders to help serve the church? And I think what's interesting here is that when we reflect on Jesus' model of servant leadership, it's actually the same question. What can we do as servants to help lead the church? And what can we do as leaders to help serve the church? Well, there's some stewardship uh, time and talents leaflets uh, which you can pick up at the back of the church and they may help direct your thoughts in this area as to how you might like to get involved and, and help. But also importantly, I'd like us just to consider how we might spread this model of leadership out in, from the church into our own lives and our working environments. What might some of us be able to do in our family lives and at work to introduce this model of upside down leadership. Well, I just I'd like to invite you to sort of bank those questions and there may be something that we can discuss in home group. And we'll move on with our second aspect of servanthood, which is sacrifice. I want to turn our attention to the, um, the second reading we heard this morning, which was via the video clip. And it's taken from John 13 the washing of the disciples' feet. And just to quickly give some context here, at that time, washing someone's feet was considered so servile that not even slaves in some regions would have done it. And I think probably not that surprising when you bear in mind the sort of sweaty, open-toed sandals and dirty, dusty ground. Now, it doesn't mention it here in John, but it does say in, in Luke that the disciples are in the throes of arguing 
about who's going to get the biggest office in the coming kingdom. And it's in the context of this heated debate that Jesus, sitting near the head of this sort of heavenly hierarchy that the disciples are mapping out, gets down and actually starts washing their feet. And I think it's important to sort of notice the great sort of irony here. You know, we've got the disciples bickering about who they're going to lord it over in the, in the new kingdom. And then we have the Lord of Lords getting down and actually washing their feet. And the response from the disciples that, that, that we heard um, from Peter is very revealing. Peter says to Jesus in verse 8, You will never wash my feet. To which Jesus replies, If I do not wash you, you will have no part in me. Now, I think what's really significant about that interchange is that the disciples are actually no further on in their thinking about God than they were in 900 BC. They're still thinking of a God of worldly power and of greatness, not a servant who will kneel at their feet. He's much too big to kneel down, and he's too great to be servile in their minds. And in a way, they're actually missing God because they're looking for him too high and wide, when actually he's too near and too low for them to even notice him. And of course, the problem with thinking of God in these terms is it makes it incredibly difficult to accept his grace. And that's why Jesus replies, if you do not, if I do not wash you, you will have no part in me. You see, we have to be prepared to let him kneel down before us and accept his sacrifice. And for the disciples to do that, they need to turn their view of God and their thinking about God completely upside down. And I just, I wonder how many of us today miss God or don't find him because we're looking for him in the wrong way. Another very interesting thing about this passage is how it leads directly into the metaphors of the breaking of the bread and the pouring of wine. And it's representative of the broken body and the shed blood, as we know. What Jesus is doing here by kneeling down and getting his hands dirty to clean us is also actually a metaphor as well. And it's a metaphor for how he came down from the Father to make the ultimate sacrifice to cleanse us of sin. And can I just say, if you're with us today and you're not a Christian, you know, we're exploring ideas of sacrifice and salvation here that are central to the Christian faith. But you may well have more fundamental questions that you need answered first. You know, what is the the evidence for Jesus' claims here, and and why is there suffering in the first place? And if if that speaks to you, I'd really encourage you to hang around and don't be afraid to ask questions. And, you know, anyone will help. Just ask, ask, ask. It's It's a safe environment to interrogate this. Just as a quick tangent, my wife, Emma was very excited last week because a new series of Waking the Dead has started, um, which is great news. If you don't already watch it, I'd like to recommend that you never do. It's horrific. Um, uh, as, the, uh, as the plot unfolded, we witnessed the usual uh, string of, of murders, and the, in the finale, the sort of surprise culprit Uh, was a very serene and loving mother. She actually had a condition called um, Munchausen by proxy, which basically forced her to seek attention by uh, harming and uh, creating illnesses for those closest to her. And during the episode, we witnessed the, the terrible relationship that she has with her own parents and the neglect that she suffers from them. And at the, at the end of the, of, of the episode, we're left questioning who's actually responsible for these deaths. Is it just the mother's nature um, and her condition? Is it the parents' neglect of her, uh, which is the primary cause of the condition? And who shaped the parents to be so selfish? You know, how far back do we go before we realize who's really to blame for these wrongdoings? And I think... The wider sins of the world are really complex. They're rooted through generations and generations of broken souls. And nobody's prepared to take the blame for them. Instead, what we actually have is a blame culture. We're more inclined to blame people on the fringes of society. Sometimes we'll blame people that maybe don't share our faith and our religion and our vision. And often even we blame God. 
But I think the reality is that, is that we're all to blame. We're all corporately responsible from the moment that Adam and Eve fell from grace. But what Jesus does here is he comes along and he says, I will take the blame. I'll sacrifice myself. And I'll take the hit. And that's, that's what a servant heart is. And, that, and that's what kneeling love is. It's this complete opposite to what the Jews expected from a high and mighty God. Jesus says, it's not my fault, but I'll get down on my knees, I'll roll up my sleeves, and I'll take the hit. Just to recap quickly, we can see in Jesus' leadership and, and in this great sacrifice for us, this perfect example for us to follow, but I think if, if Christ only came as an example to follow and live by, he would be actually no part of us at all. He'd really only just be a burden. And we'd think, oh, well, I've got to be a serving leader. I've got to be a loving neighbor. I've got to be a suffering martyr. We just, we'd simply never be able to act like this on our own. So where does the power come from to help us want to live this way? And where does the power come from to transform our hearts? Well, to get this power, we need to understand the depth of the love shown for us on the cross. And that leads us into the final aspect of of servanthood here, Jesus' love. I'd like to just keep this simple and get across two things about about this um, aspect of servanthood that have sort of helped me personally understand it better. They could be summarized really by two questions or, um, or two objections, I guess. And the first one goes like this. And it, it follows on a little bit from that theme of corporate responsibility that we just talked about. And it's whether Jesus was the Son of God or not, why should one person's sacrifice account for everybody's blame? And I think sometimes when we take that for granted, but it's actually quite an abstract concept. Why should one person sacrifice account for everybody's blame? In Genesis 18, in the first recorded prayer in the Bible, Abraham speaks to God and is asking him to save uh, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he has relatives there. His nephew Lot is in the city. And God is going down to judge the city in mercy based on the outcry of some of the people in there. And what's quite interesting here is it actually develops into more of a a sort of haggling match than a prayer. But we have Abraham asking God, if there are 50 good people in that city, will you save the whole city for the goodness of those 50? To which God replies, yes. And Abraham, emboldened by that uh, positive uh, response, pitches in at 45. Um, he gradually, over a period of time, works his way down to 30 to 20, and for other reasons we won't go into, he stops at 10. But what this is actually pointing to is that God would actually do it for one. It's pointing us to the cross. God loves goodness so much that he'd corporately save everybody just for one good person. And this is the the concept of corporate salvation. And I think one of the reasons that we find that difficult to sort of grasp today, or at least I I personally find that difficult to grasp as a concept, is that in our contemporary sort of Western society, we have very little sense today of corporate responsibility. And I think, you know, you've you've only got to look back 100 years to see how our our society has, has shifted from a corporate structure to more of an individual-centered structure. And just to give one quick and sort of rather trite example, but just think of children. You know, a hundred years ago, children were barely allowed to speak. And so some of you are probably thinking, hallelujah. Um, but, but, you know, look at it today. If they're inclined to do so, children uh, can sue their parents. And, you know, there are lots of other examples in other areas of society where we see the individual uh, rights uh, protected and and brought to the front of of our thinking. And I think to help us get our heads around that idea in a slightly different way, I just want us all to imagine that we're part of a tribe, uh, maybe in biblical uh, times, and someone from an opposing tribe comes in and kills one of our leaders. 
what would we do about it as a tribe, as a people? Well, the obvious answer is we'd wage war, and we would wage war against the whole of the tribe that took out our one leader. And effectively what we're doing is corporate retribution for this one single life, and we'd punish everyone connected with that crime for this one act of evil. Now, even today, we can still relate to that concept, and it's particularly relevant when we think of what's happening again in Libya. Now, we don't necessarily agree with it, but we can certainly relate to it. Now, at the cross, what God does is he turns that concept of corporate retribution completely upside down, and he says, I love goodness so much that I will save everyone for just one righteous man. So rather than punishing everyone for one wrongdoing, what he's actually doing is saving everyone for one good person. And I think it's, it's, it's just an amazing statement about the breadth and scale of, of his love. Second question um, about the cross, this is the last thing we're going to cover this morning. So the question or objection, I might, might go like this, lots of people have died as martyrs for various causes in history. What makes Jesus' death so significant and why is it any different? What makes it so significant and why is it any different? It's, it's true that Jesus did suffer a physically brutal death and if you watch any more of the Passion of the Christ, which flicked up there, you'll, you'll, you'll see that... Um, Witness, the words bruised and wounded used in Isaiah 53, 5 were only used to describe the most agonizing and torturous deaths. However, we're also told in 1 Peter 3 that Jesus descended into hell. And although there are varying opinions on the nature of that descent, and I'm conscious that I'm on slightly dangerous theological ground there, it's clear from Matthew 26 as well and other corroborating passages that he did take the cup of wrath and experience something far worse than physical death. Now, I I personally find it useful to at least try and understand what he actually took by descending into hell. And there are only really a few places in the Bible where we can get a sense, and it probably is only a sense, of the nature of hell. There's a very helpful passage in Luke about the rich man and his servant Lazarus where we witness the rich man in hell displaying all the classic characteristics of an addict. He's seemingly in complete denial of his circumstances and never actually tries to get out of hell. He actually just tries to get his servant Lazarus back in to mop his brow. If we can just quickly develop that analogy of addiction, just as as an illustration, there are three typical phases to addiction. It's disintegration, denial, and isolation. A quick excerpt that sort of explains this process. Uh, An addict starts disintegrating physically and mentally when they need more and more of the substance to achieve less and less of the effect. Disintegration leads to denial. The addict will typically say, there's nothing wrong with me, um, and I'm still in control of my life, but they don't appear that way to others. Finally, the addict progresses to a state of isolation in which they're completely divorced from reality and view any potential help as interference. Now, Christianity asserts that souls don't die. They go on living forever. C.S. Lewis puts these, these two things together, this addictive process going on in our souls over eternity. And he says this, There are a great many things that would not be worth bothering about if I only live for 80 years, but which I'd better start bothering about if I'm going to go on living forever. My jealousy or my bad temper may not be a huge problem now, but imagine if they get gradually worse over a million years. It might be absolute hell. In fact, if Christianity is right, this is precisely what hell is. Hell starts as a grumbling mood, always negative, always blaming others, but you are distinct from it, and maybe even criticize it in yourself. But eventually it will consume you, and it will consume your whole being, so that there is no you left to stop it. Just a mechanical, grumbling disposition going on forever in complete isolation. Isolation. That 
That's why Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's experiencing the complete isolation and the cosmic rejection from his father. He's experiencing hell. He didn't have the peace of mind of a typical martyr who believed in good faith that once he died his physical death, he would go straight to heaven. Jesus had to experience hell first. That's why his death and this final act of service for us is so different. That's how much this cost him. And that's how big his love is for us. And it's the resource that we need today to transform our broken hearts and give us the passion to try and grow our own servant hearts. And this is, this is the final bit of, of sort of upside down thinking that I want to leave you with this morning. And that is that rather than the power to transform us, coming from Jesus' worldly might, it comes instead from the abundant love in his sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your coming kingdom. Thank you for sending us your son and for the manner in which you sent him as a servant. Thank you for what that reveals to us about his nature and what it reveals to us about the nature of your kingdom. Lord, we pray that your spirit would work in us and give us the wisdom to see the depth of your love through Jesus' great sacrifice. And let that give us the power to start growing our own servant hearts. We ask this in Jesus' great name. Amen.